Hey, John. Hello, and welcome to Eat Sleep Code, the official Telerik podcast. I'm Ed Charbonneau, and John Bristow is my co-host today. How are you doing, John? I'm good. I'm good. How's everyone out there? How are you, Ed? I'm doing okay. Awesome. This is the new code or uh, Eat Sleep Code newsletter that nice. I'm hacking away out here in the very last minute. So go ahead and publish this guy to my LinkedIn profile here. Uh, this is all the links that we'll be covering today, and I'll share this as soon as I get it up here. Um, it is the second week of December. Can you believe that, John? I can. <laughs> yes, I can. That's how dates work. <laughs> just discovered calendars all right so those are up on LinkedIn and um, as soon as I figure out how you find this I will share it I don't know if that's the, the actual link or not but uh, let's see that's that's last week I'm assuming I'm assuming this is it I'm gonna share this link let me know if you guys can, all right. can or cannot get to it. But uh, this will be all the links that we cover. And John, I'll share it with you on private chat in case you want to open it for any Thank reason. Thank you. Uh, so let's start with a little bit of .NET and uh, Blazor news. Uh, so this is a GitHub repo that is an experiment by uh, one of our fine folks over at Microsoft, Damian Edwards. And Damian Edwards has been working with uh, minimal APIs. And one of the things that he's trying out, this is an exploration, by the way. This isn't like an official framework or anything like that or feature, just something he was tinkering with. Uh, he's exploring how to return a rendered Razor component, which is the component model we use for Blazor. So think of them as like a, uh, maybe like a micro framework using Blazor, uh, returning a, uh, Razor component was essentially a, a view um, using that technology uh, with a minimal API. So if you look at the example here, you know, you've got your minimal, minimal API, you, you build your server, and then you do a map git. So when somebody hits the uh, backslash, uh, oops, and I'm going to jump off of the page accidentally. Um, I was trying to zoom in. Apparently, I don't have my zoom tool in, and the next best thing is if to uh, choose a different tab. So um, we can choose the map git here, and uh, that's going to map the index or backslash route to an extension method that he's created to render the hello world razor component and pass a parameter to it. So uh, the uh, component is here, this layout HTML, it receives that message parameter, does some uh, little switch here to display the message if it's available, and that's it. It renders the HTML out. It may not seem like much, but uh, Razor, Razor components are really powerful, and they're super mm. easy to write and compose different components into a view. So uh, this could be a really interesting and powerful tool. So it's something to follow. Uh, make sure I like you, it. Yeah up here and, and hit the watch button and uh, see what, what uh, Damien Edwards is doing with that. So that's pretty cool. Uh, more yeah, minimal are, APIs are, are always yeah. a good thing. I mean, mm -hmm. they certainly help uh, kind of shorten the amount of, of boilerplate, I would imagine, that you have to write for all these things. So Yeah, these released in .NET 6 and uh, improved in .NET 7. Uh, a lot of folks are starting to jump on that and, and play around with it, make microservices and things using .NET. Mm. And just kind of consolidate their controllers as well. Uh, speaking of Razor components, again, that, that model that we were just talking about, if you're doing any Razor component development, uh, whether you're building your own uh, UI components or you're just composing them into views within an application, um, you need to manage your CSS somehow. I've seen a lot of uh, people struggle with CSS in Blazor. Um, I think a lot of people are um, not as fluent with CSS as they are with you know, C-sharp technologies and stuff. So I thought I'd write about different ways you could manage scope in ways you may not have uh, seen before. Try to open up some new ideas here. And this was part of the C-sharp advent calendar, which we can 
Open another tab here. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, we talked about it last week a little bit as well. But uh, the idea here is, um, you know, you've got your global scope with your CSS file, which you're, you know, run in the mill vanilla CSS stuff, you know, your app.css and stuff that's in there can get accidentally overridden. Uh, if you have a developer just, uh, you know, writing the same selector after you have, uh, that will override, you know, last, last in rules here. So uh, that, you know, that's kind of the global scope. So we, to combat this, we get CSS isolation, which is a feature that does the complete opposite. And I wasn't a really <laughs> big fan of this feature when it was implemented in Blazor. All of the uh, front end frameworks have this, by the way, and I'm not mm. a fan of it in there either, okay. uh, because it does something that I write about here. It's, it, to me, it's an anti-pattern, right? Mm. So what does the C stand for in CSS? Cascading. Cascading, yeah. And what does CSS isolation prevent you from doing? Prevent cascading. Cascading. <laughs> so <laughs> literally working against the system here. Uh, so at first I was like, I'm never going to use this. It's stupid. Like nobody should ever touch this. And then um, I started looking more at the uh, CSS language and things that you can do with it. And I found, a, I found an interesting loophole in this. And that is with um, C CSS parameters. So are variables. So custom parameters are yep. the other name for variables in CSS. And you can actually kind of create a, um, a defined scope with this. So if we look at the code here, you can actually set up a private scope inside of your isolated CSS. And what you can do here is you can say the default value for that is going to come from that global scope. So you could still use your global scope to define how these components look. And then through the magic of inline styles, which is also something I said I'd never use again, mm. um, you can actually override some of these uh, color options and, and other uh, variables in your private scope through an inline style because the specificity is so much higher. But the thing is, you're not setting a... Uh, typical property on an element here, you're actually resetting a variable. So you're not passing in like a whole bunch of stuff to this inline style. You're just saying this color that was red, I want that to be blue now. And every place that that variable is used, it's going to set that color to blue. And you can kind of pass things through that way. So you get like this full range of all the right things. Like you get the global um, styling, you know, you can set global styles. Some of those things can be optional. You can set uh, styles at the component level. Uh, you can set them at the, the actual instance level as well. And you can get like the best of all worlds through. Uh, so through just, this. just hang on that for a second. I just want to mm -hmm. see if I understand what's happening in that example. So on that div sure. tag, we have a few things going on. Up. Oh, nice. <laughs> all right. So. On the div tag you were on before, we have actually three things going on. Well, four things, actually. Actually, mm -hmm. more like five. So we have a div tag. That's one right. qualify. That's one selector. We have a class scope. That's another selector. We have a uh, style. That's a third selector type. And then we have this another type, which is the B-Q-F-A-F-X, okay. blah, 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 which is an index selector. On It's an identifier for that which is applied to both the div and the span. So yeah. what's really interesting about this is that you do have a little bit of cascading, but only to a certain point where CSS isolation will take over based on, I guess, the scoping resolution rules for CSS, I guess, meaning you can, yeah. you can trump all these though, can't you, with a um, bang important, couldn't you? You can get no, sort of, cannot. couldn't you? Mm -mm. Okay. So the way CSS isolation works, and this goes for a couple frameworks, I think React, um, I don't know if Angular does it exactly this way. Uh, I believe Vue does it too, is uh, the framework will add these in. I added them in manually here because I'm hosting yeah. it in Blazor REPL. It doesn't have this feature built in. So there's a little blurb here about this being a manual implementation of it. But it, it essentially injects this into your code. So you'd write it without this. It injects this. And then on the HTML, it has the same attribute. So this is an attribute um, selector. 
So it's selecting on that attribute. That's why it has these mm. braces around it. Yes. This is like one of the most highly specific selectors you can get. And yes. this is generated by the compiler. Yes. So in order to override this, you would have to do it after the application has been compiled and you would have to know the unique identifier for it. To so inject, yes. Yeah, so you could override it, but not in any meaningful way. Like as a user, you know, an end user, I could go on the site and write a CSS thing to override it. But as a developer, it's not going to hold water because the next time you compile it, it's going to, it could be a different unique identifier. Now, so, the, the other thing I had mentioned was bang important. You said that that wouldn't apply here. No, so you couldn't accidentally override this in any way, shape or form. So, uh, okay. Aztecs pointing out one of my favorite stories. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not advocating its so use. Like, don't get me wrong. I'm not yeah. saying you should do it. I'm just, I'm trying to, yeah. I'm trying to understand the rules. It protects to you from that. Yeah. Okay. I'm trying so to understand totally the squishy boundaries. From that. Okay. So, um, if you're, if you're not just a CSS developer and you, you know, some.net, uh, this actually would probably make sense to most folks. So I put in like the C sharp pseudo translation of what's going on here. So, you know, we have our private scope with our underscore variables here. And you can, you can't touch those from outside the class, right? Unless you use the properties. So if you use the public properties, you can get and set those values, which gives us control mm -hmm. within the scope of the getter and setter. So we there's no extra code in here, but when we set this, we could do other operations on it before that internal private value gets set. So we have full protection of that private variable. This actually works the same way in CSS using this methodology because okay. we have this private scope selector, which exists here on this div. Yes which can only be accessed from within uh, the component itself. So okay. You can't write any CSS code from outside of this component that's going to affect this private bubble background color at all. Okay. Um, yeah, this is way, although, way deeper than I, than I thought this, this <laughs> would, uh, I would want to go on this. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so okay, it, cool. what it, what it does here is it cleverly sets a um, a public color. Like this could be considered like dependency injection. Like I could go into my yeah. CSS file and I could provide a fallback for this okay. uh, th through this color here. But internally, no nothing can override that. So I understand. Yeah. And then uh, in the public properties, it will set an inline style, which will then override this internal setting here. So I can do whatever uh, code that I would like during that setting process and protect it in, in any way that I'd like. Uh, so this gives you like that, that you know, private public um, scope in CSS, which is totally bizarre feeling, but it works and it's, it's a is it enforced? It's is it enforced though? Like, is there anything stopping me from using JavaScript, for example? Again, like you could, you could abuse this break, somehow. Break my own it, contract. It's not. Can yeah, I? Can I shoot myself? <laughs> it's more to keep developers from accidentally doing things that they're they're not supposed to do. But you know, you could okay. always go and manipulate the DOM and and make yes. it do something. But as a program, you know, it's you know, you're kind of like I could go onto my bank website and right click inspect and change my bank balance, but that doesn't really oh, do Oh, of course, anything. I do it all the time. Who, who, who do you think you're talking to? I've got, I'm a millionaire, didn't you know? <laughs> yeah, so, so yes, you could kind of circumvent these things, but not in any meaningful sure. meaningful way to permanently affect it. So it's, it's a really interesting thing that you can do uh, because of those two technologies, um, and uh, it kind of opens up a new, new world of uh, writing these things out. It's really, really interesting and nice. that was part of the c sharp advent we talked about this last week and if you're not in the know yet there is a website uh run by matt groves uh who works over at couchbase and uh he organizes community to post two.net blog posts every day throughout 
the uh, month of December until the holidays. So we got 25 days of two articles, so it's 50 articles coming out in December focused on .NET. So you can catch mine there as well as all of the others. So we're up to about uh, 16 minus one late entry, about 15 articles nice. there this week. Uh, so keep keep tuned into there. Uh, there's some good like stuff it. in there. Um, the, like how to utilize secrets in MVC was one of the latest ones. And that's always helpful to get a refresher on. Uh, if you're not already working with that, make sure you look at it. Um, I have some great coworkers, so I, I wanted to focus on some things that are not just Blazor. Uh, and Alyssa from our team is uh, working with the folks over at Angular, and she's announcing uh, dot, or, um, Angular 15, I almost said .NET. Angular 15 is here. Um, That'd be crazy. So, yeah, we're already up to 15. So lots of new stuff. Looks like a pretty big release, too. Uh, there's CLI improvements. Um, there's all sorts of goodies in here. And uh, if you're into Just hold on Angular, that list for a second, because I haven't sure, seen this yet. Sure. I'd be curious just to see. So standalone API stable, okay. Directive composition, API, image directive. Functional router guards, router unwraps default imports, improved stack traces. Improved stack traces would be interesting to me. CDK list box, experimental ES build support, automatic imports, CLI, blah, 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 blah. Cool. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wasn't aware that they were this far down the road on this yet. So, um, yeah, she was, she's got kind of a all. All things update. Wow. Read about all of it. It's a nice big blog post there. So if you're hmm. doing the Angular stuff, follow Alyssa. Uh, check in. <laughs> well, I, it, great, great so photo. Her personal like self out there. I, I get yeah, yeah. Alyssa, That's good. She's so much fun. Uh, so <laughs> check her post out. Speaking of Alyssa. Speaking of Alyssa. Let's see if I've got a link here. This is. Yeah. Give me one second. So she also got in touch with the folks over at the state of CSS. Oh, cool. And That's yeah, awesome. She did an exclusive with them. So she got access to the results of the state of CSS. Uh, yep. She jumped on a stream with them and Catherine, and they kind of dove into what's coming in that uh, results. Hot. And can't get the results yet they're still not up so if you want to see this early uh jump over to our twitch page i'll, I'll link it in chat it's also on that uh link what a good get that's an awesome uh, get it is it really is yeah um, i i was uh i was gonna try to join her but she had so many good guests already i was like you know what yeah i'm not adding any value here i'm going to go ahead and just watch <laughs> <laughs> so uh i'm gonna post that in chat because i know People are going to want to get on that before. Look at that chat window. Everyone's just peppering them with questions. Yeah. Yeah, it was uh, super popular. Um, and like I said, it, the survey's coming out. It's great to hear, like, all the features that are uh, people are interested in because there's a lot of things in there that are still, like, on the can I use. By the way, I, yeah, got, yeah. A, I got to look at this and um, see if I can find it in one of the screenshots here because I can't show it because you can't access it anymore. Uh, or even yet, but inside of each of the um, sections here, let's see if I can find one. Okay, I'm just gonna pause it here. Uh, <laughs> there, there's a an icon here. There's also another one yep. that you'll see on these when they're feature based. So if it's like um, like CSS feature in particular, uh, you can click on that and it will link you out to like, can I use? Oh, so okay. You, yeah. So you don't have to go Google all these things. Like it's already all linked up on yeah, the yeah. Um, Good. thing. So, nice. so check that out when it comes out and uh, check out the video. Get get the commentary on it from the folks that are working on it. Uh, so there's a Love really it. awesome panel there. So check yeah, that out. Yeah, that's definitely something I should want to check out. That's awesome. Um, this is also another good .NET post. Um, Syed from uh, Microsoft. And uh, and Mike Russos, hope I pronounced that right. Uh, they've been blogging about uh, migrating from ASP.NET to ASP.NET Core. Uh, this is something they're continuously working on. There's all sorts of migration tools that they have, uh, and they're they're talking about some more of uh, these through Visual Studio and whatnot. So make sure you check that out. 
I won't go okay. into too much detail on that, but um, there, there's quite a few of those up at the uh, my dev blogs at Microsoft.com. I, I don't know about you, Ed, but I don't use the migration tools. I select all, delete, start from scratch. <laughs> <laughs> Just you're, you're the rewrite guy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I like being the rewrite guy as well, but that's not always the option, right? I know, I Sometimes know. Sometimes things are but just not, but hard. but I would say that uh, a migration tool is is the other end of the spectrum, and I would argue that they can only go so far until uh, we have is... AI, of course. But yeah, the AI is going to take over everything. We'll get to that in it a minute will. too. We we've, we've got yes. an article here from you about that. Uh, first, a uh, little quick mention here. This is something that um, my coworker uh, posted yesterday, Catherine. Um, she, she's an amazing like uh, dev on design and accessibility and whatnot. Um, and this is kind of an opinion piece. Um, it's like, I, I don't know how to explain to you that being a developer means you have to care about users. So she's talking about- Well, um, duh. <laughs> yeah. That's like self-explanatory. Yeah, but unfortunately, a lot code. of developers don't understand that. You're absolutely mm -hmm. right. So. Yeah. So it's just a kind of a good read, and uh, I think she was venting a little bit here. Uh, yeah, but fair enough. It's still it's still fun to read, and uh, maybe something you might want to share with some coworkers that need a little nudge, right? Yeah. There's a lot folks. of uh, there's lots of rakes to step on if you don't do this. <laughs> so there, the, yeah, that's a good analogy. I love it. Um, yeah. So th there's some good reasons in here like she points out the reasons why you should do it even if you personally like don't feel like you need to yeah it's not my job I, I know so many of those people throughout my career i know i know in software development so or otherwise right yeah so i think Catherine, being the fact that she's a dev advocate for kendra you kendra react is mm -hmm. uniquely positioned to talk about this and it's definitely something that um we miss a lot in the in the industry which is hey listen um your software is going to be used at some point by other humans so uh, take some care in in understanding what they're looking for focus on outcomes not on features um if you can and uh yeah it's it's hard i understand that i like that she makes this post personal to her though she's like these are real users <laughs> damn it <laughs> yep real people yep. the real people yeah talking about so yeah that was that was a fun read I, I stumbled onto this morning I was like, oh this is a good post by Catherine. we should share it uh and then finally and then we'll get on to um the subject you wanted to talk about today john yes uh last one's gonna be a big here, one which is a good se segue for for what you want to talk about because it does uh -huh. have to do with ai okay uh, so this is uh the game portal uh, this is gaming related, but it is AI as well. So Portal is a game that was released 10 years ago. Um, and this was built on like the original Half-Life engine. Uh, it's a fantastic game. If you haven't played it, you should try it. It's like a puzzler meets 3D shooter. It's inspired a lot of clones over the years. Uh, it's got RTX um, enabled ray tracing now. So uh, the ray tracing stuff on nvidia uses some ai to help boost the uh frames per second that it can draw so it doesn't fully like retrace scenes it partially retraces things and then uses ai to smartly like fill in the blanks and it does a really convincing job of uh doing it so there's this huge graphics update that came out today that you can download if you have the game you can get the update for free and you can get all the fancy lighting uh, effects. So it's doing real-time ray tracing in a video game. Uh, and while it's an old game, it like breathes total like new life into it, makes it look fantastic. Um, and then even uh, the, uh, what's, what's the other game called? Fortnite, another big game, get, also got the same type of update. So uh, it went from a very cartoony game to one of the best looking games that's out there right now. So two two gaming things to check out and again those are uh based off of uh ai technology um that kind of enhances and accelerates those i wish they'd show it on here i had a graphic of it one time uh they broke down how the ai fills in the blanks um and it was really cool so speaking of ai john just tell us <laughs> a little bit more about chat GPT, gpt we talked about it a little bit last week but, yeah uh, it's, it seems well, like you have a lot more to tell us. 
Yeah, I, I I really didn't have much other than this because this is so big and so monumental and so impressive that I felt it deserved some time to talk about this. So we've been talking about GPT on this show for months. I don't know if you meant if you guys remember, but um, OpenAI and GPT we've talked about for a long time, which is um, basically a technology that is um, the GPT stands for a generative pre-trained transformer. And it's, the idea is that um, it allows you to, it uses deep learning to generate human-like text. So it's it's very, um, it's very good at generating uh, based on an initial uh, prompt, like a, like like a question, for example. It will generate text that um, that answers sort of questions or commands that is issued to it, and it is super impressive. Um, so. Um, GPT has been under iterations for quite a while now. They are up to GPT-3. In fact, I think GPT-3.5 is now available. And until recently, it kind of flew under the radar because a lot of people were looking at it and, and thinking about it and using it in certain contexts, but it wasn't universally accessible until now. So recently, OpenAI announced uh, a facility called ChatGPT, which is linked at the top of that page. And what this does is it basically gives you uh, a portal into utilizing a GTP 3.5 interface. Um, so it's like talking to a bot uh, in a sense. But once you start playing with this, it is hugely impressive. GTP, chat GPT is really demonstrating the power of what these language models can do. And it is scary good. Um, now, for the longest time, I've been a strong naysayer around AI, true AI. Um, machine learning, 100%, that is definitely applicable today. But um, it wasn't until I saw chat GPT where I was like, holy expletive, this is amazing. It's very, we're, getting, we're well on the way to having very strong um, AI, not, not you know, <laughs> um, generic intelligence, but like very strong AI. And so what's happened if for the folks who don't know, um, the, uh, this came online last week. And so Sam Altman, who's the CEO of OpenAI, put out a tweet saying, Hey, it's, it's available. Go check it out. Yada, yada, yada. You can use it. And people have been banging away on this. And the reaction to this online has been nothing short, but holy crap, is this amazing? And it is, you have to see it for yourself. You have to this is, I would go so far, people have, I, I will not say this, I will tell you what other people have said. People have said that this is the end of Google as a search engine. People have said online, not me, but others have said this is the end of Stack Overflow as a means of getting answers to questions because this thing wow. is so good. Um, that's a, that's now, I don't know if I, yeah, I know these are bold claims, <laughs> you know, it's a bold strategy. Let's see if it works out for them. Um, so this is the central interface you have to register, but once you've registered, it will give you basically a prompt. And to give you an example of that, if you if on that previous page, Ed, it showed you an example of a dialogue that would occur. So in that gray area that you just passed by, um, in the prompt area, the questions are posed in the bold text. So in the gray area above, sorry, dark gray area. Oh, that's a good example right there. Yes. So what what you will pose are questions or commands to GPT and it will generate for you prose. Um, and it, it has ways people have been circumventing it, by the way. So they've been they've been able to figure out that there are certain commands that allow it to browse there. Um, there are ways in which you can convince GPT to generate answers you're looking for. Um, now, the reason why they've done this is because they want to train the model in a way to make it more safe for general use, etc. But people are using it in very interesting ways for code gen, for doing all kinds of, for bootstrapping projects, for bootstrapping articles, um, so much so that um, actually it's gone so far now that um, I, I think, I believe I read that Stack Overflow is now banning the use of GPT to answer questions um, oh, wow. on, on Stack Overflow. Um, people are getting very insightful answers and they're comparing it to what they would get with something like Google or Bing. And they were like, why would I use this? This is in great. This is crazy good at how well this answers questions. So the whole reason why I want to bring this up is because it raises some interesting, it raises all kinds of interesting questions about 
you know, what's capable, what's it capable of, what's it possible, is it ethical to use this, etc. Um, I think it is. I mean, it's, I don't, I think it's just a yet another tool. And then you think, you know, if you're a futurist, you think, okay, if this is the trend, like this is so, it's not disruptive, but it is so impressive. And it really, what it does is it's for the first time, this is putting, it's putting chat GBT into the hands of general users, I think. Um, and I, I, I haven't seen it this good before. Um, if you want to, if the best way to see this, Ed, is to go online to Twitter and just search for chat GPT and you'll see example after example after example where people are posing questions to chat GPT and they're seeing answers come back and it is amazing what is generated. Now, to, to the layman, it is amazing. And I, you know, I'm a bit of an AI layman myself, but um to the AI people, they're like, this is strong. Like this is this is actually quite impressive in terms of what it what it can do. Now, AI folks have been saying, like, no, we've been doing this for years. Like, you know, not not like this is not new to us, but you know, mm -hmm. um, but GPD 3.5 is actually quite impressive in terms of working with natural language, etc. So um the way this works and the way it operates is is quite good. Um so yeah. <laughs> Anyways, very simple, but um, it is something you can check out. Now, the the interesting thing about ChatGPT is they announced this on uh, Sam Altman announced this on Twitter on uh, on um, on uh, December fifth, and since that time they've had over a million people register. Um, I think it's I think they're just on this, the cusp of this. This has been lighting up Twitter. This has been lighting up Hacker News. This is all over the place with people stating how impressed they are with what they're seeing in terms of this. And so it raises, as I said, all kinds of questions around, you know, um, code gen, um, people have found problems in longstanding, like longstanding bugs that they didn't know existed in their code. They've, they've been able to ask it, like, tell me a joke, tell me a joke that involves these people. You know, I've seen that. Um, I've seen, I've seen ones like describe to me the uh, write for me a script where Jerry is trying to work out the bubble sort algorithm and, in a Seinfeld reference and include um, script dialogue. Um, there's one that I've seen, like, describe the bubble sort algorithm in a 1940s style villain character. Like, ah, so there's bubble sort. See, you're going to go and, you know, take this element and rearrange it. See, that sort of thing. So um, it's able to do that. It's able to um, generate text. It's, uh, it is somewhat um predictive like you can kind of guess what it's going to say now this is not the interface you'll use this is using this is citing examples that mm -hmm. that ed is walking through here but it's the same engine underneath the covers and you can write these long-winded sort of descriptions you can say create for me a uh, text that involves these characters with this plot and blah 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 and impressive. make it three paragraphs so yeah, it's 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 generalized and it's it's working on obviously natural language and it's quite impressive. Now, some some side notes that are that are relevant to folks who probably watch the show. It uses Azure. Um, I don't know if it's hosted directly on Azure, but um, I think Sam Altman has has touted Microsoft and and Azure as providing the a lot of great building blocks for them to use. And um, oh god, um, <laughs> I what? But he lacked the resources to get it off the ground. What? All right. <laughs> Worked hard and made his made a success for his business. All right, whatever. <laughs> so, anyways, you get the idea. And um, I don't know. What are your thoughts, Ed, on using you know something like this for for the purposes of um, you know work? Do you see it as just another tool? Do you see it replacing humans? Do you fear the robot uprisal? So, I think there's some cool ideas that I've I've heard other people kind of play with before, um, where they they want to use these things to help whiteboard an application. So maybe you're in a, a meeting, you're doing your you know, weekly standup or something, planning an app, um, and you have you know, some smart device recording the session and based on the things that you're uh, brainstorming in the session, maybe it's, it's coding up a sample, like it's doing your proof of concept in the background. So, um, you know, like the saying, like uh you know building a story for you like you know as far as coding goes you're like well i, I want to have a mobile app that does x y and z and it's like well here's what it could look like sure like i've, I've seen people that where they want that but I, I don't think it's going to get to the point where people can't you know people are replaced by it 
Well, um, I mean, it's it's funny you mentioned this. Like, chat, there's uh, the most recent example I saw was the uh, Chat GPT just passed the AWS certified cloud pr practitioner exam. So, I mean, there's things that it can do that are just bonkers. So, yeah, make a red ball bounce on the screen. Like the, I guess this is now it can't that... generate it can't generate imagery or, or it doesn't image doesn't generate imagery. It will generate ASCII art. Um, yeah, so this is, you know, some examples. Make a snowstorm on the black background. Okay. And so it's going to go ahead and think about it and then generate code on the right-hand side. Right, written out on the side. Yes. Except this, and then, the UI here is funky because I'm zoomed in. Yes, already. it's a little funky. Yes, you may have it zoomed in or I don't know. Yeah. So, um, oh, there we go. Yeah, it's now you could, now let's, let's change this up. Right in the instructions, Ed, type right. the following. Copy and paste that same, copy and paste that same instruction for me for a second. And instead of make a snowstorm, it says make falling emoji symbols or make falling faces of Ed Charbonneau on a black background. What was that? Falling was faces, uh, uh, making falling faces of Ed Charbonneau on a white background. Now, I don't know what this will do, but we'll see. I mean, the, the example I gave, you might be able to see kind of the idea here where it's, uh, it's a pen, is it clearing that code or appending it? No, it's appending it. So I don't know what this is going to do. So one may get drawn Somebody told other. me this one day, they were like, you know, if we're all in a room and like, you know, I want this mobile app made that suggests. <laughs> there's your, there's, there's that for you folks. The, the doge. I know. Um, oh, well, never mind. It looks like it has a compiler error, actually. Yes, that's part of the problem. There's a JavaScript error, it looks like. Delete that, maybe. Delete that top section, maybe. I don't know. So, like, uh, uh, create... How about create a, create a DVD logo simulation, a DVD simulation, DVD logo bouncing DVD logo thing, but instead of the DVD logo, use a doge emoji or whatever. All right, sure. Like this is this is kind of the the thing that uh, it's actually doing. See, it's doing a pretty good job here. Like, it at least coded up a form with lunch mm. options. So now, now, is... now, it should remember. It should remember. It's um, it's conversational, so it should remember. So type this in. Replace tacos. Now just type in. Replace tacos with beer. And just hit enter. It's conversational. It should remember. Yeah, look at the query selector. Boom. Here. So yeah, this is this is the thing that that I was kind of talking about. Like you know, you're you're at a whiteboarding meeting, and you're you're gonna you know launch this new app, and everybody's trying mm. to you know here's the features that we want to have. Now it didn't necessarily make like an app that did this, but it's like okay, this is where we're gonna start. It's kind of like the um, what I suggested with the uh, the 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 ones that do artwork and um, right. also the ones that do music, right? So the the example is from probably about three to six months ago. We had a show where they uh, I found an article where they recreated or created rather um, Beethoven's which orchestra or symphony was it? It was a piece of work that was unfinished by Beethoven, basically. And <laughs> they they ran it through AI, not only his past works, but other influences that he may have had in those time periods. Right. And then presented that to musicians. So they're, they're, they weren't like, the AI created music, here it is, listen to it. They're like, all right now you mu musicians take it to the next level like this is this is the direction it's going make it actually sound like what it should you know it's good music i think that's where so, we'd, so, we'd end up with this. yeah so to so give you an example like i I've, i i just sent you a link in the private chat there where nick chaps is a uh, uh we, we both know nick and everyone loves nick in the dot net community um he actually posted a video on youtube called chat gpt can write better code than me <laughs> and, where he shows how he's using chat chat gpt um uh, in a coding session on twitch and he published it to youtube and what's crazy good about this is 
like he, the whole time he's just holding his head. He's like, oh my God, this is amazing, you know, sort of thing. So, um, and that, that example there that he shows in his video um, does go through the process of showing you what the interface looks like and how it works and all that sort of stuff. And it shows how it's conversational, meaning like do this, tweak that, blah, blah, blah. It's very impressive. Yeah, it's it looks like it's trying. It didn't do anything, but it, it at least it wrote a randomizer, but it didn't apply it. <laughs> didn't update the UI, but yeah, it's pretty cool. I mean, it, that's is something that, that I could. I I think it. I think useful. this is going to change. It, it certainly changed my opinion around where we're at. Um, where it's just going to change a lot of people's perceptions around where we're at with AI. We are crazy crazy close to having very strong AI, not not like sentient, but very strong sort of language processing. And I think what it's going to do is it's going to make it's going to make a lot of competition in the fine stuff on the internet um, space, because I don't think the game now is going to be it's going to be more about do what I mean, not what I say, meaning like try and help me find an answer rather than just indexing the entire internet. We, it, nothing has shown us more clearly that, I mean, it, so the fact that people have to write site colon reddit.com or site colon uh, hacker news or news.ycombinator.com into their search query because they don't find the search results meaningful enough in Google should is, is a signal to say, look, our search engines today are not as great as we would like. People are polluting the internet with SEO garbage and stuff and it's really lowering this the it's really um it's really decreasing the signal to noise or sorry yes decreasing the signal to noise uh when it comes to searching uh online and so what language models like this do is they they really get to the crux of what you're trying to do faster and yes it's not online per se but it is giving people what they want which is i have questions and i need answers and i would like you to help me formulate an answer to a question I have. So, and I yeah, think it's, it was, I think it's groundbreaking. It was trying to create the game Pong. It was doing a pretty good job of coding it. It looked like, okay, but I think it ran out of space or tried to do something it wasn't allowed to do in the browser. Yeah. So it, now it, this it, is, now this is in line with what GitHub introduced with Copilot. The difference there is that Copilot is using um, more of the, the code that's publicly available online for its index. So, um, whereas uh, a general language model like this is um, definitely transformative and um, in terms of the queries that come in, whereas Copilot, I think the combination of Copilot with something like OpenAI, Chat, GPT, GPT in general is really going to form the future of where we're going relative to coding. This assistive-based uh, um tool for getting people's uh intent um done quicker and i think coding is going to be the one of the first industries that is probably disrupted in a big way by by this i would go so far to say that i think i think we're going to see a huge disruption here low code i think was people thinking this is disruptive this is not as disruptive i think as what the future holds for uh with ai ml uh gpt etc i think that is far far more disruptive copilots that sort of thing i was trying to explain this in words and it just doesn't come out right so this is the ray tracing thing that i was talking about john so you've got like the scene without the ray tracing and then the ray tracing happens but it does it on like a low resolution scale and then it fills in the blanks with machine learning and then applies it to the image. Does that make more sense? Yes. Like it looks like when you see like the scattered, it reminds me of those, um, uh, what is that called? Like um, when you when you look at a fine pr or print, like on a newspaper up really close, the, yep. uh, what is that, that called? That old school uh, print technology. You know, you have the little tiny dots everywhere. Uh, so you see, you see all the little pixels and things, but when you zoom out, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you, you kind of, your eyes kind of just blend the whole thing together Sure. and, sure. um, you, you get all the shading and everything like that. But up close, you know, the colors 
are just little dots. This kind of works on a similar principle, but you know, it's you're actually ray tracing a lower resolution of of this so that the AI can go, okay, I know I know how to fill in the blanks for this. And it may not be 100% accurate, but to to us, you know, humans looking at it, we don't notice any of the the detail that's lost here. So it's it's doing a pretty darn good job of it. Um, and this is how it's doing these games right now. So you're, it still takes a little bit of processing power, but you know, you saw the thing I showed earlier. It was like 20 frames per second without this machine learning uh, functionality added to it, and it's like 100 frames per second with it. So you're you're getting like, you know, massive speed boosts with this. So it's it's really cool. Yeah, I I would go so far as I would go so far as saying that GPT chat sorry chat GPT is do you remember when Google first launched and everyone was like oh my god this is so much better than what we've had to use in the past and yada 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 I think for the masses something like uh, something like RTX AI drawing that's fine right like mm -hmm. I don't think if people are just gonna be like as long as it looks good I don't really care I don't care how it's doing it just does it. But I think Chat GPT is going to be this is going to be the impact of Chat GPT, and I, I know I'm stepping on a limb here by making a, a prediction here, but I think this is going to put uh, ML and AI into the mainstream um, so much so that this is going to be the expectation now that this is going to be what this is what people envision, like when people think of computers, they think of magic and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. This to me is, is is this is the most impressive tech demo I've seen in a long, long time. Like VR goggles and metaverses and all that stuff. You I'm say that, say John. something else. Yes, that stuff oh. is. Uh, but I I understand a lot of that and like yeah, fair enough. You can you will we'll get an iterative improvement. Chat GPT and this sort of improvement is so just so different. It's like a ninety degree turn. From the direction yeah. we were going, that so I I can't I can't, you know it's like Pandora's box sort of thing. But I think this is going forward going to be a huge benefit for everyone as a tool. So what's interesting here is you 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 separate these things as if they they are different things, um, and I I think of it all as one holistic thing. So you you have this really cool thing like we just showed where you can say yeah, write this code for me or show me this or answer me that. What if you have a VR headset on or a, a AR headset on, and you're you're standing in the middle of Times Square? And I know you're you're already probably laughing in your head, but you're like, "Show me what this looked like in 1947." Fair enough. Yeah, and I know it where you're going. redraws the environment around you based on yep. past images and things that are in its its uh, model, and physically redraws a 3D environment around you. I'm with so you. You can see what you. it looked like. I mean, maybe you're in your basement and you're you got a VR headset on. You're like, show me New York Times Square, 1947, and yep, let me walk yep, down yep. the street. And it, it just is able to build that out for you. That would be phenomenal. That would be so cool. And, I'm with you. and also all of the accessibility things that we could probably do with this. Yeah, like that stuff. That stuff. Yeah, really I cool. was. Uh, I was. I let me put it this way: when I first saw this about half a week ago, I was like, holy crap this is this is huge this is this is very big i even wrote my dad i said you're going to hear a lot about this you're going to hear a lot about this in the coming months this isn't even hit the mainstream the mainstream has no idea this is this is hit and like the tech community is going bonkers over this and wait until the mainstream folk um get their hands on this not i'm not saying that as like a negative thing i'm just saying like they're gonna their their heads are gonna pop off they're gonna be like oh my god this yeah. is awesome well we're, we're gonna you hear know. the usual like it's uh you know it's smarter than us it's gonna kill us all no no i know that's the first thing they always gra grasp for them it's like that's that's not how these things work <laughs> it's not it's no. not general artificial intelligence no no we're a long way from that yep all right, but John. This, this is an awesome thing. I, yeah. I, 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 sorry. I know we dedicate a lot of time to this. This is the one. No, this, this is, is the one thing that hit my radar, and I was like, "Holy, 
this is insane this is insane I didn't expect it to to be live or i could play with it either it was nice i got to try that out live on stream um I, hopefully you know next time we can get it to actually make the, the pong game that would be awesome <laughs> That'd be cool if you could just say, I want to play this game. People are doing this. There's game. YouTube videos of Nick Chaps just genning code. Like, he did a stream where he said, he's like, I can't believe this. And then he he typed in something, and he ran away from his computer because he was so impressed. He was like, oh, my God. And he did that classic YouTube reaction video type thing where they, like, scream, and they lo ran out of the room like they saw a witch or something. I don't know. So, anyway. All right, John. It's been great catching up with you. <laughs> and uh, we'll we'll definitely keep our eye on the tech especially, you know, as we go into the next year. Okay. John, thanks again for the fun conversations. Cheers. And I'll see you soon.